see we've got a good crowd here already, and we appreciate you all being here. Uh, if anybody has any uh, interviews or anything we'd like to do afterwards, we'd certainly make ourselves available for that. Uh, with that, I want to say, uh, uh, without a doubt, from the bottom of my heart of all the press conferences I've ever been to, this is absolutely the most recent. Yeah. Right. Thank you all for being here.
attention for just a second, please. We are going to start the official event here in about two minutes. So uh, if you could uh, uh, finish up the conversations and or uh, take them to another part of the agenda, that would be great. Most importantly, be better servants for you. We have not 
because we ask not. So we ask you, the only one who can give it, for wisdom, for mercy, for justice, and humility. We ask these things sincerely and humbly. In the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names, amen. Thank you, Senator Hamilton. I appreciate your uh, words of uh, prayer. Uh, I would like to introduce to you another state representative that is here today with us. He is from the Tulsa area. Uh, he is actually from Sky Two, a great town that I used to love to drive through when my uh, mother would take us to Tulsa to visit. Uh, I love the name of that town. And uh, uh, Representative, Representative Clay Stairs is going to be our next speaker. His district is directly in line with the Gilcrease Turnpike, which we are going to talk about more today. So let me introduce to you Representative Clay Stairs. Clay, come on up. Thank you very much. Yo, my name is Clay Stairs. I am the uh, representative for House District 66. And uh, so uh, I am the representative for this group of folks there in Berry Hill and uh, that are right here on the front row. So, uh, yeah, so in my role, my key role as your representative, as well as the other representatives, my role in a situation like this is to make sure that doors get open for you to talk to the people that you need to talk with. And uh, if you're having a hard time in any kind of situation getting through to someone that you need to speak with, please get in touch with me and I'll help open up those doors. Uh, and secondly, if there is a law that is in place that is causing things to be very difficult or if there, you need to have a law in place to relieve uh, pressure and stuff like that, that would be a place to come to your state representative because we write law. Uh, beyond that, I, that's, that's kind of what we do. We open doors, we act as a bridge, and we write law for you. So if those are areas that can be of help for you in uh, your request as you guys are trying to move forward with different things that are going on, that is a great time to come to your representative. Uh, an ongoing thing right now, which is wonderful, I was able uh, to meet with Melissa today. We were able to get a meeting with Attorney General uh, Gettner Drummond. That would be a role for me. Let me get a meeting with you and uh, Attorney General Gittner Drummond. So that happened this morning. It was a very good meeting. You guys were able to talk about this is what we're looking for. Uh, Attorney General Drummond was able to say, here's what I can do. And so we came out of that meeting with action steps of what's going to happen next. So did that go well? It was a good meeting? Okay. Yeah, it was a good meeting. So that, that would be our role, and I am perfectly happy to do it. I did have uh, some members of the OTA come into uh, my office the other day, and they were saying, Clay, we want to explain what's going on. And, and my role here is I don't, really, I don't really care about the big picture of what's going on. I'm here to open a door for my constituents who need doors to be open. That's my role. I'm not here to, to pick a side and I, was going, I don't have a picket you know, sign that I'm going to walk around with. I'm just here to open doors and then if there is a law that needs to be adjusted or written, that's my role. So I'm perfectly happy to do that. I'm here to serve. This is why I was elected and I plan to continue to do that as we move forward. So thank you very much for letting me come today. I appreciate you guys. Thank you, Representative Stairs. I appreciate your time and, uh, and your words and, uh, towards our cause. I would like to now introduce to you uh, one of our legal advisors, one of the attorneys who's been on the, oh, oh, wait, wait, all right, Annie. I'm gonna bring you up next, Rob, hold still. I, I introduced Annie Mintz previously, and uh, unfortunately, I didn't notice that she wasn't in the room, but she is here now, and I would like to introduce our representative from Norton. And Annie's district is the district that I live in and is the district that is uh, uh, most greatly affected by the uh, Southern Extension. So please welcome uh, State Representative Annie Mintz. Hello again. Um, 
so I had to step out for another meeting. I'm a freshman, um, so I'm learning that thing where I have to be everywhere and also nowhere at once. I've almost got it, not quite. Um, thank you so much for coming, taking time out of your day and your work um, to be here and hear us. So Brandy's asked me to talk to you a little bit about um, what you do whenever you're going to visit a legislator. So as some of you know, I was a legislative assistant and an executive assistant for about seven years before I decided to run for office myself. Um, so I just wanted to share with you a couple of best practices and some pro tips um, whenever it comes to you visiting with legislators. So the first thing you wanna do is figure out whose district you live in, whose district you vote in, um, and find them. The next thing you want to do is find out their assistant's name. Remember it and be kind to them. Their assistants are nonpartisan staff. So that means that they work for every single person in the district, regardless of their political affiliation. They're sometimes here, they don't get to take lunch sometimes. Um, they're here after hours sometimes, uh, working tirelessly. They are public servants, they are wonderful, and they have big hearts. Um, so always remember to keep it kind with the assistants. Um, their personal views might not reflect the views that their boss has on certain bills or certain issues. Um, that's not what they're paid to do. So um, always want to remember to be kind and respectful of them. Uh, whenever you go and you visit about um, really anything, you want to keep it as specific as possible. So um, if you have an ask, that is great. Always remember to, if you have a bill number, if you have something specific that you want that legislator to do for you, if you would like a call back, if they've stepped out to a meeting, which very possible. Um, if they're not in, whenever you stop by, make sure that you say if you want a call back, you want a letter back, you want to set up, set up a meeting, make sure you're very specific. Um, when visiting with them on this issue specifically, um, you want to go over what you're doing here, how this affects you, um, tell your stories. Those of you who are losing your homes, you know, I remember last summer when I was going door to door visiting with folks, hearing their stories is what prompted several bills that I filed, um, why I'm standing here right now talking to you, just listening to how, like, the, the human toll, how this affects you and your family. I remember talking with a guy in, in the uh, town who isn't in the path, but he has land in the path that has been in his family for 80 years. Uh, those are the things that you don't forget, those stories. So share your stories, don't be afraid to do that. Um, and, and keep it specific and make sure if you speak about things happening in the courts, um, make sure that you keep that relevant to the legislation that is going through because these representatives and these senators aren't going likely going to be in the in the courtroom whenever things like you know the lawsuits and things are decided. Um, we're here. We've got a ton of bills that we have to get through on the Senate and House side. Right now we're switching, so the House is going to start hearing Senate bills, vice versa. Then we've got budget process. We've got a lot of a lot of plates in the air. So. Um, keep that in mind make sure that you keep it as brief as possible um, and like i said if you want to call back that's what we're here for we're supposed to communicate with you we're supposed to have open doors uh, we we want to hear your stories so please keep that in mind there are people here that actually are receptive to what you're what you're saying we just we need you and especially those of us that have filed bills um, dealing with these issues, it helps if you, it helps us to put a human face to why we've done this, why we filed, why Annie filed an open records bill, why I filed the actual notice bill, it, because of your families. Um, so, like I said, please don't be afraid to, um, to visit about that. I also would suggest to, if you are, you don't have to be particularly tech savvy, but it's very, very helpful to learn to navigate the, the legislature website. So um, OklahomaHouse.gov or OKSenate.gov, it's um, OKHouse.gov, um, to be able to track bills, to be able to find 
who your legislator is, you just put in your address, and it'll pop up with all of their information, their websites and everything, their pictures. Um, if you can navigate around that website, you can, you can do this. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, feel free to contact my office. If I don't represent you, I will find out who does. I have a really great assistant. Her name is Melanie, um, and she'd be happy to help you. So uh, thanks again for taking time. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to grab me. So thank you. Annie, thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm going to just kind of piggyback on what Annie said. I have been up here working uh, the legislature for the past few weeks, and I was a little intimidated by the process, quite frankly. Uh, I didn't know how to talk to these people, but they're just regular people just like the rest of us, and they do want to hear our side of the story. They do want to know what's going on. And one of the things that I would encourage you all to do that are here for the rally today, when we are done with this, I would encourage you to go and talk to legislators. Let them know what's going on with you and how you feel about these things. One of the specific bills that I'd like to mention just real quickly is uh, Danny Sterling's bill, uh, 2263, uh, passed out of the House. Actually, it passed out of the House by a vote of 89 to 3, which is pretty overwhelming, I thought. Yes. certainly has a lot of momentum coming out of the house, but the, the procedure as I understand it, Annie, be ready to correct me if I don't say this correctly, uh, it now has to go before the Senate Transportation Committee is where it will likely go, and then they will have to vote on that to get it out of committee to be heard on the floor. So if you are going around today uh, and want to talk to some legislators, I would encourage you, not just exclusively, but I would encourage you to talk to the senators, especially the ones that are on the Transportation Committee, and uh, tell them uh, your feelings about uh, 2263. And uh, also, uh, Senator John Haste is the chairman of the Transportation Committee, uh, and uh, Jerry Outboard is the uh, vice chair. So those might be two specific people to talk to, as well as the members of that committee. And that committee is available if you have the app called 59. I believe it's done by the uh, cooperatives. And at home it lists all the legislators and uh, their office numbers, phone numbers, email addresses all that kind of stuff and it would be easy to find out and there is a listing of the committees on there as well and you can find out who those committee members are and i would encourage you to uh do that we appreciate again we appreciate you all being here and hopefully that uh we can follow through and, and make some inroads with uh, our legislators let them know our side of the story you see where i am on the schedule here all right uh right now i would like to bring up uh, our one of our legal experts and to talk about uh, the legal situation and where it stands, there's a number of cases that have been going on, a few things have been decided, and there's a, a bunch of things that have not been decided yet that uh, uh, certainly has our interest. So let me introduce to you attorney Rob Norman. Rob. All right. Well, I always like to talk about a little bit more than just boring, wonky legalese and civil procedure and where the cases are at. So I'm, I'm going to do that, but I'm, I'm going to weave in really some of the story. Uh, I, I kind of start with uh, this story with uh, something Senator Hamilton said in his convocation that we're fighting, we're, that he's hoping we have success in our fight with City Hall. And that kind of struck me a little differently than the usual case because we all know what the we all know what the, th the expression is: you can't fight city hall. Well, the truth is, if you fight hard enough and things are on your side, you can fight city hall. But the weird thing here is we're not fighting city hall. And Senator Hamilton, that brought what Senator Hamilton said brought that to mind. And we have, he's turned around the wrong way, but we have the city of Norman's Ward 5 city council member, Richard Tortorello, who just showed up. What struck me about that, uh, that, that phrase he used in his convocation is how different this fight is and how important it is. Because the weird thing about this is we're not fighting City Hall. In our fight, City Hall came out with us right away by a nine to nothing vote in the city of Norman and said, no, don't do this. 
I don't feel like we're fighting the legislature. We've had Representative Stairs come. I've seen a, a little bit of Danny Sterling. I've seen Senator Hamilton. We've seen some of Norman's contingent come up. And I've talked to some of the legislators here, and I've never felt like they're saying, we're against you and you're crazy. And what are you trying to do? Uh, the OTA is right and you're wrong. Get out of my, get out of my office. That, that's not what's going on. I don't feel like we're fighting the courts uh, because every time the courts have had to make a decision on the merits, one particularly notable one, the courts have made one decision on the merits at the district level and ruled that the OTA willfully violated the Open Meetings Act. I felt like in oral arguments before referees and the courts that the courts kind of get it too. So what are we fighting? Well, what we're fighting is we're fighting government overreach. We are fighting a public trust, an administrative agency that is supposed to be acting as the servants of the legislators, as the servants of the city councils, as the servants of the people, ultimately, an extension of the people. And they're not acting in the interests of the people. They don't behave anymore. The OTA was originally put together as something to connect different distant places when the federal government wasn't interested in it. Connecting Tulsa and Oklahoma City, connecting Missouri and Oklahoma, connecting Texas and Oklahoma, and they did a fine job of that. And even up into the 80s and 90s, when they wanted to come through Norman and Cleveland County the first time around, and, and eastern Oklahoma County, they asked first. They didn't tell. They didn't just spring it on us one night and said, too bad, this is how the domain process works. Um, we're gonna take your land, so sorry. They asked first. And when the people in the city councils back then said no, they said, okay, you've spoken and we've listened, we're not gonna do this. This time it's different. This agency doesn't behave anymore. This agency doesn't have the legal guardrails they need on them anymore. This agency has to be stopped in the courts. This agency has to be reformed in the legislature. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how that's, how that's going on. Uh, we have four basic pieces of litigation going on right now. Three of them are lodged firmly in the Supreme Court with all the lawyer work done, all the, the filings done, and the Supreme Court just has to decide. First, of course, is the bond validation case, which is the case that says, are these routes legally authorized? Can the OTA issue bonds for the three turnpikes in the South Oklahoma City metro area, or are they legally unauthorized? We feel very confident about that. We felt the oral argument went well. We felt the briefs went well. We feel firmly that the law is on our side and have felt that way all along. What we are just doing in the bond validation cases, we're just waiting on a decision, and everyone up to ask, when are they going to decide? When are they going to decide? When are they going to decide? Well, the short answer is they're going to decide when they decide. They, they, they don't have a deadline that says thou shalt decide by this day. What they do have is the statute that allows the OTA to file this case says they will make it their priority. And we think they kind of have. They've had, we've had a oral argument in front of a referee. We've had a oral argument in front of the whole Supreme Court, both of which we think went outstanding for us. And then they have to get back and they have to decide their case. What I kind of think is an educated guess that's going on is we all know last week the Oklahoma Supreme Court made a decision in a very important abortion case. And there is another abortion case that is at issue in front of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. And those case numbers are just a little bit before the OTA bond approval case, if you look at them. So it was natural and it was expected that the Oklahoma Supreme Court would make that decision before they make the decision in the turnpike cases. But I think the bond approval case is now up in the queue and to be decided and I believe the Oklahoma Supreme Court will act promptly. There are also two cases. There's the Pikeoff District Court case and there's the Open Meetings Act District Court case, which are both on appeal right now. Those two are fast-track appeals. Everything's been done that the lawyers can do. 
there's not necessarily, there could be, but there's not anticipated any more briefing or substantive things to file. And the Supreme Court has decided to keep those cases in front of them because of the importance of the issues and the importance of what's going on with the turnpikes. And usually as a rule of thumb, those fast track appeals, which these are two fast track appeals, be decided in say six to nine months, usually in under a year. So what we've got is we've got three cases that are lodged in the Supreme Court that are just awaiting decision. Feel great about all of them. Uh, we also have, of course, and unfortunately Stan couldn't be here today, he had some court conflicts, so I'm kind of doing a little tap dance and talking a little bit about his cases without stealing his thunder. We also have the Key Tam case, which is currently pending in litigation in the district court. It's not gotten to the point of being decided on the merits, obviously, yet. But that is the case where the citizens of Oklahoma and the citizens in the area impacted by the turnpikes are again asking the OTA to follow the law. They have not. They have spent, at last count, over $42 million on an unlawful, invalid turnpike project, Access Oklahoma. And the key TAM plaintiffs, because the OTA won't do it, uh, are saying, okay, OTA, you have a legal obligation to get that unlawfully spent money back, and you have it. So therefore, we have to act as private attorney generals, as citizens of the state of Oklahoma, and get the public trust authority to actually do its job and serve the people of Oklahoma. So that's going on with the key TAM case. It's kind of like two lighthouses. We have kind of two lines of litigation going on. One is, we call it the pike off litigation, and the other we call it the, the Open Meeting Act litigation, although it's also Key Tam Act litigation. Stan did make a great analogy I saw in, in a speech the other day about how they're two lighthouses, and they act complementary to each other. And, you know, one does one line of exposing the OTA and their problems, the other does another in another way, exposing the OTA and their problems, and they all come together and say, these three turnpikes are illegal. They're not a done deal, they're a dead deal. They're unlawful. They were rolled out unlawfully. Even if they were rolled out lawfully, in the end, they cannot build them according to the law. Now, those are the battles. Those are kind of like, you know, nation states, we're here in the halls of law, justice, and politics, which all intersect here. We had the Supreme Court oral argument here on the second floor. Uh, we have the legislature meeting right now. Uh, the legal cases are kind of like the battles. Nation states going at each other. The courts decide who's right and who's wrong on the existing law. But then what we have to do is we have to build a lasting peace in front of the legislature. Unfortunately, that gets messed up a lot. Uh, you know, the, the side that's right will win the battle, and then the peace gets messed up for whatever reason. But we're here in front of the legislature there's an OTA, there's an ODOT, they're gonna be in the world. We need good roads, we need good public infrastructure, we need good transportation, but we're here in front of the legislature to say there's a better way to do it. There's a way that, do, that, that abides with due process, that gives folks out in the Gilcrease notice of court cases. The whole Gilcrease deal, which was a newfangled legal deal, a hybrid sort of turnpike, sort of not turnpike, wasn't supposed to be a turnpike at first, they went in front of the courts and these people didn't even get notice. It was published in a newspaper. I thought and it went through by default. And I thought these people must not care when I was looking at that case. No, they care. They just didn't know about it. Uh, no one told them. Uh, we just got lucky on Facebook and whatever other means of getting notice of a, of a law case. And we, we figured out that this was all going on and got started. But they kind of got railroaded through uh, without, without knowing there were law cases on new things going on, we're trying to change that. We're trying to make sure due process is followed. We're trying to make sure real legal notice is followed. We're trying to make sure that we reverse the process to what it's supposed to be. We decide whether a turnpike is lawful. We decide whether a turnpike is in the best interest of the people before we decide we're gonna run over people. And if the people decide it's a good thing, if it's good policy, if it's lawful, then we build the road according to good policy and good engineering practice and things like that. 
So really what we're trying to do is we're trying to restore the, the rule of law to Oklahoma. Uh, it, it, it's, we're in a very dark night in a very gray area. We're trying to restore the rule of law in Oklahoma. We're trying to restore representative democracy, which is suffering badly with government overreach and agencies run amok. Uh, in, in, in autocratic ways of rule rather than democratic ways of rule. And with your help, and we continue to do this, we can put this back together. We can, we, we can put the rule of law, representative democracy, government in the sunshine back in the hands of people. So let's do that and let's keep this up. Thank you. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit. If any of you have a published agenda, uh, we're going to switch things around just a little bit. We are very grateful. Uh, on uh, the 15th of March, uh, Oklahoma Attorney General Gettner Drummond announced the call for an investigative audit of the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority. Yes. not my job. I'm the umpire. I call strikes and balls. We need to get to the bottom of the issues that have been raised in Cleveland County. And at the end of the day, we will see how decisions are being made in the state of Oklahoma. And on a go-forward basis, I can assure you that the decisions in Oklahoma will be with the full opportunity, adequate notice to the public, an opportunity for you to raise your objection and for government to listen. Because at the end, we are we represent you. You are our, we are the government of Oklahoma. And I deeply appreciate the zeal and enthusiasm that's represented here. Uh, and I encourage you to continue the good work. And I'm there with you. Thank you. Attorney General for being here and getting the drum and let's give him another big hand. All right, we're going to switch back to the original schedule and I'd like to introduce to you uh, a very active uh, person in our uh, endeavors to uh, convince the legislature that they need to pay attention to the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority and I will let you, I will let Amy speak of her credentials since I didn't get it quite right the first time. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, Amy Serrato. Hi, everybody. Well, it's been a year since we were here for the first time, and I think the mood has changed drastically. Last year, we were angry and confused, and this year, I think we stand with resolve and optimism. My name is Amy Serrano. I'm a professional engineer. I got in this fight because the proposed Southern Extension that was not authorized by the legislature and was nowhere in the books. 
was going to run right through my living room and take all of my 10 acres. But a year later, I stand still with you as the president of Pike Off OTA and the Oklahomans for Responsible Transportation because I've learned some things about the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority that just aren't right and we need to make changes. So with my job as a professional civil engineer and through my work with the Oklahoma Department of Transportation, I do a lot of work on roadways. I mitigate problems on roadways. I do a lot of the pedagogical studies that go into when you're fixing a roadway or widening a roadway. And everything about how the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority has done business in the last two decades is the antithesis of what should happen in an engineering world. Not only is their engineering protocol not correct, nowhere near correct, and doesn't follow any federal or American Society of Civil Engineering procedures, their fiscal responsibility is horrific. And you know they're $1.8 billion in debt, and their ballooning debt payments are See, are going to be higher than their projected revenue. And so they've gone through a series of toll increases that our friends at the Gilcrease and in Tulsa are feeling in their pocketbooks every day when they drive to work. And so reform is necessary. We have been exceedingly successful in this last year. For the first time in 70 years, the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority got beaten court. And that is because of our, <laughs> our great citizen volunteers and our fantastic legal team. Because when you speak truth and light, eventually it all has to work out, right? And every time we open our mouths in this great community that's been here for over a year, every time we open our mouths and find facts, and our researchers dig up the truth, the courts agree with us, the legislators agree with us, everyone that we talk to agrees with us, besides the people that want to keep it the same way, so the elite can continue to make money on the backs of the Oklahoma citizens. And why we are right here today is because we've had all those wins, but in order to keep those wins, we need to change some things in the legislature. We need to change some things in the Turnpike Enabling Act. And some of those items that we want to change are that we need to provide real notice to pro property owners within a one mile of a proposed project prior to requesting bond validation. Did you know that the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority is the only agency with the powers of sovereign eminent domain that do not have to provide real notice. I think that's a problem that we need to fix. We need the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority to engage with municipalities and the public in mutually beneficial interim design protocols well in advance of legislative authorization requests. When you conduct a civil engineering project, what do you think the first thing you need to do is? Maybe maybe have a need for a roadway, first of all, and then get citizen buy-in that that's a roadway that they would use. And then maybe you do some studies, like an environmental study or an impact study, historical artifact study, archeological studies. How many studies has the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority performed for the 59 miles of proposed roadways in Cleveland County? Zero. Zero. They have not done any studies. In fact, when they illegally built the Kickapoo, they also did no studies. And in fact, their traffic revenue and projection study from CDM Smith came in 16 months after they took the first property on the Kickapoo. And so they do things backwards, and that needs to change. We need to sunset any lo location authorization over five years old. Because right now, in the Turnpike Enabling Act, they have routes all over the state that affect 600,000 Oklahomans that have been in statute for more than 30 years. That's a generation ago. And so sunsetting those authorizations is an important thing to think about. 
we need to require OTA to garner municipality support and conduct feasibility studies before coming to the legislature to request authorization. We don't want to stop the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority from existing. We want them to actually follow good civil engineering and fiscal protocols. We'd like to require legislative permission for toll increases and requiring a state audit every two years or before any toll increase is granted by the legislature or revenue bond sale permission is granted by the Council for Bond Oversight or the state Supreme Court. You heard the Attorney General, Gettner Drummond, tell you that his call for the investigative audit was the first in 70 years that the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority will be required to go through a state audit. That is ridiculous. They say that they audit themselves, but you know how that goes when you have an internal audit. It's a lot of pencil whipping and Excel spreadsheets to make things look like they're okay, when in fact, they're really not. And we really do hope that what we found in our research turns up in that investigative audit and that we can have faith that our government is treating our money and our roadways and our state in the manner that they should. We believe that the 1955 legislative edict to allow cross-pledging should be stricken and each turnpike should have to pay off its own individual bond indebtedness to ensure that toll roads being built are justified, necessary, and needed. The reason, so the reason why they only have four tollways that make money is because of cross-pledging. When you don't have to do civil engineering impact studies and you don't have to talk to municipalities, you build bad roads that no one uses and that other roadways have to pay for the maintenance on. So as the Oklahomans for Responsible Transportation, you know we believe in the protection of property rights, the prevention of government overreach. We believe in properly planning and financing roads. We also believe in the preservation of land, wildlife, water, and agriculture. And we believe that roads should be owned by Oklahomans and be free to drive on. I think we're going to get there because we've opened a light into 70 years of darkness that no one was able to, to tap into before for whatever reason. It's the time this year with Pike Up OTA, the Oklahomans for Responsible Transportation and our friends in the community, our great legal team and all of you community volunteers that have been phenomenal. One of the best things that come out of this absolutely horrific activity in the last year has been a wonderful community of like-minded people from all walks of life that believe our property rights are sacred, that believe that the government should be fiscally responsible, and that believe that the government should actually tell us what they're doing, especially when it has to do with our money. And so... Regarding or requiring sound engineering and fiscal policies of our public-private partnerships like the Oklahoma Turnpike Authority is good business for Oklahoma. Our contractors and our engineering consulting firms and all of us, our economic development prospects are much better when we have competition and we have transparency. We build better infrastructure. And so we have the opportunity to make our state a lot better than it is right now by requiring the OTA to actually follow not only the law as it's written now, but further guidelines that we want to put into our legislation to follow the federal and the American Society of Civil Engineers protocols on how you actually should do business. And so we're calling for our legislators right now to help us protect the future of Oklahoma and our children so that they never have to feel the threat of eminent domain for an unauthorized roadway. And we want to take this rogue instrumentality of the state 
and we want to strengthen that Turnpike Enabling Act. Because if we don't put guidelines up and guardrails up for the future, this same entity will keep steamrolling our children and our children's children. So all Oklahomans, I feel, will be better off when trust, transparency, and accountability is restored to our government. And I want to tell you that you should keep on fighting because how many people told us that we wouldn't make any headway last year? And how many of us felt so hopeless and helpless? But right now I'm telling you, we have the ear of all the elected officials in the state of Oklahoma. We have the ear of a lot of legal minds that are going to help us right this wrong. And I want to tell you that you should stay the course and keep fighting because together we're stronger than any of us individually. Thank you for being part of Pike Up OTA and stick around. Hey, Amy, thank you. Uh, Amy's an expert in these areas. One of the things I want to talk about real quickly is the way the Turnpike Authority goes about setting up turnpikes in the first place. What they do is they uh, uh, work with a firm that does a toll projection, uh, car count projection of what those turnpikes will pro are projected to bring in. And on, based on those projections of the revenue that will come in, they decide they break the bonds, they take out a bond issue that they have to pay off from the revenues of those toll roads. Well, historically, throughout the whole history of the Turnpike Authority, those toll projections have only been 63% accurate. 63%, 37% less than what they need to pay off the, the bonds and maintain the turnpikes. Uh, when I was in school, 63 was an F. The Turnpike Authority continues to operate that way, and we see that even with the Kickapoo. The Kickapoo Turnpike uh, was projected to bring in a certain amount of revenue, and they have they have been woefully, woefully below those projections. In fact, uh, we have a handout over here on the table that, that speaks to that directly. Uh, it's titled, The Kickapoo Turnpike is going to need a bailout. And from what we've seen, based on the projections, and then based on the actual data, that's going to be sooner instead of later. So that's one of the things that we can talk about when we go to see our legislators. Again, I encourage you here today, thank you for coming, but we encourage you to go around and talk to the legislators. They will be on the floor. And it's kind of fun to go up on the fifth floor. Uh, the Senate gallery is on this side and the House gallery is on that side to watch how the process works, to see how things unfold on the floor. And that gives you just a little better insight of how things might work. But it, one of the things that does work is talking to our legislators, especially the uh, Transportation Committee, because like I said, 2263 is uh, up for uh, a hearing in the committee, it needs to go to the floor, it needs to pass, and then it needs to be signed by the governor. And the fact that it passed 89 to 3, uh, that makes it what we call veto proof in the House. So I think momentum with the uh, legislative uh, or with the investigative audit called for by Attorney General Governor Drummond, the bill passing out of the House, the court cases that we have won, uh, I think uh, it's a great indication that things are moving in our direction and the more we can do to uh, grease the wheels uh, by talking to our legislators and getting the word out, that's what we need to do. And I appreciate all of you all being here and I encourage you to hang around. Uh, Kelly has, uh, we have, Kelly, hold up one of those t-shirts. We've got some, we've got uh, pike off t-shirts, uh, Oklahoma's for Responsible Transportation t-shirts and other goodies that we'd like to give away to you for coming today. Uh, so please uh, stop by the booth. There are cookies and uh, some bottled water. So please enjoy that. And again, I thank you all very much for being here today. It's been a pleasure to get to know all of you in this process. Unfortunately, the stakes are pretty high for us, but one of the real joys is, uh, is getting to know all of you and, and getting to work with you all. And I hope that we uh, continue to stay close and, and uh, get this process on our side. Thank you all for being here with that. I close.